All right, so the date is September 23rd, 2018. The time is approximately 12.36 p.m. I'm here in beautiful New York City with World War II veteran Dino Cerruti. Dino, thank you for agreeing to do this today. It's a huge privilege to be able to do this. And so on behalf of myself and I'm sure all the other people who are gonna watch this, thank you for agreeing uh, to do this today. So Dino, if you could just go ahead, um, you could just, I know I've already said your name, but if you could just state your name and uh, your date of birth. Yeah, my name is Dino Cerruti. I was born on January 24, 1924, in New York City. And uh, where approximately in New York City uh, were you born? I was born on 62nd Street between 1st and 2nd Avenue. All right. And uh, tell us a little bit about um, your early life, your parents, their names, what they did um, for work, and your family, your media. My dad and mom came to this country from Italy. Um, my mom was 19. I forgot how old my dad was, about 27. And I had a brother and a sister, and I grew up in New York City. I went to Hunter College Elementary School, and then I got an, uh, a scholarship to Phillips Exeter Academy up in New Hampshire, and I worked my way through there. And from there, I graduated from there in 1942, and I got a scholarship to Yale. And because the war had just started, they had an accelerated program that started in July. I graduated in June, started Yale in July. I, I finished my freshman year by October, November. I enlisted in the, in the Air Corps because I wanted to fly. I was really interested in flying fighter planes. And I, I had a deferment. I could have stayed in college until I graduated, but I found that I thought that this would be uh, great way to get into aviation, so I withdrew from college, got into the aviation program as an aviation cadet, got my wings, got my wings in Victoria, Texas in 1943, went out to California, flew the P-39, P-38, then we went to the Southwest Pacific, and I was with the 36th Fighter Squadron, the 8th Fighter Group, 5th Air Force, we stationed on uh, a little island two, uh, two miles west of Okinawa called Aishima. And we were there for about six months. Uh, and the war ended. And we moved from Aishima up to Japan, Kyushu, a town, a town, a city called Fukuoka. And we were at uh, uh, Oshia Airfield. Where we flew P 38s. And then a few months later, we converted to B-51s. And July of 1946, I came back to the States, repatriated, went back to school, went back to Yale, finished up. I accelerated. I went to two, two summer sessions to try to, uh, to move, you know, to accelerate and catch up for the four years in the service. So I, uh, I did the two summer sessions one at Yale, one at UCLA, and then I came back, graduated from Yale, and got into Harvard Law School. That was my history. Married, had three children. Wow, excellent, thank you. So um, I was just wondering if you could expand a little bit on your childhood, what it was like growing up in New York City during the 20s, and of course through, through the Depression. Um, well, like I don't that. know if I can remember what it was like. I know I know that I went to school with my, my sister, mm -hmm. and uh, we had lunch boxes. My mother made lunches. I don't know if they do that anymore. Um, I was at a special school, the uh, Hunter College Elementary School. Uh, we lived in a walk-up on 67th Street, and those were the days when we had ice boxes. There were no refrigerators. We had ice boxes. The ice man would come every two or three days and deliver a 40 pound keg of ice slung over his shoulder. He'd walk up five flights to get, to, the ice, to get the ice up to us. We had milk, a dozen eggs and a quart of milk every morning, every other morning outside our door. They delivered the milk and the eggs and there were no clothes washers. My mom did the uh, the clothes in a in a in a, uh, a sink in the kitchen on a washboard, and we had a clothesline in the backyard, 
and she would hang out the clothes on a clothesline with clothespins. Nobody knows uh, what kind of life that was, but that was how we lived. It was tough. Yeah. And um, moving forward, um, when, you know, prior to like the late 30s and going into like 1940, 1941, uh, I'm sure like guys like Hitler were like on the newsreels or you heard about them on the radio and I'm sure you heard that he was like, you know, causing trouble uh, in Europe. Did, did in that time, that period of time, do you remember, did you have like, like a, like a feeling that maybe America might get sucked into uh, the war uh, in Europe um, with what was going on, or did you, you and your friends like talk about it at that point? No, I didn't keep up with, the, with the, uh, affairs like that. I, I didn't read the paper, I wasn't interested in that. Mm -hmm. I, uh, I used to build model airplanes, Baltim Balsa models. Uh, then I graduated to the rubber powered planes, go to Central Park, fly them. Uh, but I wasn't into international affairs. Yeah. And um, moving forward a little bit more, on the day Pearl Harbor um, was attacked, on December 7th, 1941, do you remember that day? Do you remember what you were doing when the news? Well, the only broke? thing I remember about that was I was at Phillips Exeter Academy. I was at school. It was December, and, uh, and we were doing the usual things at school. Uh, it was a shock, to, of course, and, and everybody talked about it. But, uh, other than that, I was doing my stuff. I was finishing mm -hmm. my education. That was my main concern. Yeah. And so after Pearl Harbor was attacked, did you know right away that you wanted to go into the Air Corps when the when the yes, call I, when I the call that. came for volunteers? You knew yes, right away that, that was, the Air Corps. Absolutely, that was my goal. I couldn't wait to get in. So my my parents wanted me to finish my education, but I really wanted to leave. It was boring. I wasn't particularly interested in that. I wanted, I wanted to get into the uh, into the Air Corps and get into fighter planes. So, um, knowing that knowledge, when did you um, decide to make the decision and go and volunteer uh, for the Air Corps? When I was at Yale, I was 18 years old, and I told my parents I wanted to go in because if I enlisted, I could get my 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 choice of service, and I wanted to go into the Air Corps. So they. They agreed to mm -hmm. cooperate. So when did you go in? Do you remember when you? Yes, I. Uh, I think I enlisted. I think in October uh, of 1940, 42, and I was called up in January of forty-three, and I reported in February of forty-three. And when after you reported, do you remember? where you were sent to for primary training and advanced yes, training? Yes, well, uh, the day I enlisted, mm -hmm. they shipped all of us by rail in our, clo in our civilian clothes down to Atlantic City for 10 days of basic training, which was a waste of time because we learned nothing. And then from there, they sent me up to Syracuse University for three months of what they call college, college detachment, CTD, college training detachment. They took me out of Yale to send me to Syracuse. Uh, and then from there, I went down to San Antonio for um, aviation cadet classification, which is where they classify you. They run you through a bunch of tests, written tests, uh, psychomotor tests, uh, examinations with psychiatrists, and then they classify you whether you're more, more suited for pilot training, or bomber, bomber or, or fighter flight, fighter planes, or, or navigator or bombardier or n none of the above. And they classify you and I was fortunate enough to be classified for fighter training. So they sent me to Coleman, Texas for primary training. We flew the P PT-19, PT open cockpit, two place. And then we went from there to Wichita, Wichita, Winfield, Kansas, for basic training where we flew the uh, Valti BT-13. And then from there we went to um, Victoria, Texas, where I did my advanced training in the AT-6, got my wings, and then they sent me right out to California, Victorville, flew the P-39s, 
And then from there, I went to Chico, California for the P-38 transition, and then to the Pacific. Yeah, and do you remember, um, just to talk a little bit more about your training experience, um, like primary and advanced, were there any in training, like did you experience anything that like you remember about specifically about your training experience? Like was there any event, like a accident or something that might have uh, occurred? Um, that you remember anything like that? The one thing that stands out was the first flight I ever took in a, at primary with my instructor. His name was A O Looney, L O O N E Y, and he looked less like a fire pilot than anybody I've ever known. He had glasses. He was middle aged, uh, and and it was a surprise to me. Uh, he was not a Craig, Gregory Peck or or Jimmy Stewart type. But anyway, the first flight he took me up on. Uh, without any any warning at all, he just pulls the plane up. We, had, we went up to altitude, pulls the plane up, the nose is in the air, airspeed goes down to zero, and the plane stalls and falls down, and he puts it into a spin, and we're spinning around, and I'm wondering, is, is this what I really want to do? I was really scared. But that was, yeah, I remember that. Never forget it. Yeah. And um, fast forwarding a little bit, I'm sure, the day you graduated and got your pilot's wings uh, pinned on your chest, that must have been a really proud, proud moment, big achievement. Um, it, was, it, was, it was proud, but uh, a lot of the cadets, most of them, had somebody there to pin the wings on, family, girlfriend, something. I had nobody because I, it was in Texas, my family was in New York, and nobody had time or money, or you couldn't get any on, on any transportation. It was, everything was rationed. Uh, so I had nobody there. I had to pin my own wings on. It was disappointing. And um, after you got your wings, um, you said you went on to California for transition training into the P-39? P-39, yes. And what, what did you think of the P-39 Air Cobra? Hot little airplane, very sensitive. You had to be very careful and always watch your airspeed, especially when you're landing. I know we, we had a lot of people, a lot of cadets who who died on take on, on landing mm -hmm. because they would pull it up into a into a 360 approach and reduce your airspeed to to uh, drop your landing gear and then drop your flaps and they weren't watching their airspeed you had to keep your airspeed above stall and they weren't doing it and they come around to the final approach and the plane stalls and spins it snaps over and there was no warning and P38 gives you no warning when it's going to snap so the minute you go into a stall that snaps over and you're 300 feet, you don't have enough altitude to recover. And they were killed. Mm -hmm. And so how long did you fly the P-39? Just for a month. And when you went from the P-39 to the P-38 Lightning, what was your, experience, your immediate uh, thought when you first what got into thrill. the P-38? It was so complicated because you had two engines, all those dials, and unbelievable dials, and you had to sit in the cockpit and learn all 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 the instruments on the on the instrument panel, all of them, because before they permitted you to take off and go solo, and nobody sitting there with you, uh, they they had you do pass a uh, a blindfold test, and they would, you would sit in the cockpit and the instructor would be on the wing lying down on the wing and he would name off all the toggle switches and all the all. The, radio switches and all the, all the instruments, the tachometer and the altitude, everything. And you had to sit there blindfolded and pick them out without hesitation. Wow. And so how long was the training on the P-38 Lightning? How long did that last before you went? Uh, well, overseas? it never ended. I mean, we went up and flew either solo or, with, uh, or part of a group with your instructor leading a, a flight of four either doing formation flying or night flying or, or aerobatics. Uh, we were always doing something, training, always. Mm -hmm. And how long were you in California for? Six months. Before you went overseas? Approximately six months. And when you went overseas, did you fly out to where you were? We took a transport plane. We went from uh, California to Hawaii. We stayed one night in Hawaii. And then we went from there the next day to Clark Field in, in the Philippines where we were assigned to be reported to the replacement depot called the Repel Depot. And they gave you your assignment. Some of my friends were sent to the 
China, Burma, India uh, theater, and I was sent to the 30, uh, 36th Squadron, 8th Fighter Group. Mm -hmm. And in, when you were in the Philippines, was that when you were in Manila for a week? Yeah, we were in Clark Field outside Manila. Yeah, and could you just um, describe, like, in that week, um, waiting, week of waiting, because I remember you telling me, you showed me the uh, picture. We, of... we had nothing to do, but we, we went in groups and traveled around the outskirts of Manila. We watched, we saw everything. I mean, everything was destroyed. Mm -hmm. All the buildings were bombed out. Uh, hotel, no windows, everything was black. Uh, it was a disaster. There was a church that had no roof, uh, and they had a bivouac for the army personnel living in tents just outside the church that was bombed out. It was, you know, it was ravaged city. Mm -hmm. And I remember you told me earlier that you and your friends just decided to go look for stranded Japanese soldiers yes, we, on the island. We decided that we heard there was some Japanese still still lingering up in the mountains and in the jungle, so we. We, we had our 45 caliber pistols and we went up into the jungles crazy. Thank God we didn't meet anyone. Yeah. And so after you left Manila, you were assigned to the 36th Fighter Squadron, 8th Fighter Group of the 5th Air Force. Yes, on Ayashima. On Ayashima. How long was the journey from Manila to Ayashima? Oh, I don't remember. It was uh, several hours. Yeah. And when you arrived on Ayashima, what was your uh, first impression of, of the base? Tiny little island, and it was just one huge air base, like hundreds and hundreds of fighter planes, hundreds of P forty sevens, P fifty ones, P thirty eights, groups here, groups there, everywhere. So there were several fighter groups sharing the island. There were a lot of a lot of them, fighter, not groups. just several. There were a lot of them. There must have been eight hundred airplanes on that on that little island. Wow! And uh, and, and the runway was very very short, like thirty eight hundred square. 3,800 feet long, mm -hmm. and some of the planes had trouble taking off with the combat load. Yeah. There was one, one incident where I was waiting at the north end of the runway to taxi down. There weren't a, no separate taxi strips. We taxied down the runway, turned around, and took off heading north. And I was waiting at the north end, and um, I, I, I can see a P-47 uh, coming, coming up the runway, taking off. And he got about halfway, and all of a sudden I see a big, big puff of black smoke coming out of the exhaust. I learned later that he was trying to take off with less than full power with a full combat load and two belly tanks full of gas. And, uh, and of course, he could, couldn't do it. And it wasn't until he got halfway down that he shoved his throttles full forward and the, the black smoke poured out of the exhaust. And he tried to take off, and I saw, he couldn't have been more than 30 yards away from me, and I'm waiting there, and I can see him hunched over his cockpit, and, uh, and he couldn't make it. And, he, and at the end, north end of the runway, there was a drop of, I don't know, 100, 200 feet, and his plane went over the edge and went down and exploded, and all the ammo, all the fuel, everything exploded, flames and fire and, and smoke and everything. And I later learned that the name of the pilot was Joe Parker. Joe Parker was the chief test pilot for Rock Republic. He had more time in every, every model of the P-47 than any pilot in the world. And he was sent down, I think he volunteered, he wanted to go down to show these combat pilots who were having trouble taking off with full combat loads. And he was gonna show them that he could do it without full power. And of course, of course, it failed. He died. Mm -hmm. That was yeah. Joe Parker, mm -hmm. test pilot. Yeah. Wow, that's a fascinating story. Uh, thank you for that. Um, so, when you were on Ayushima, could you describe the living conditions that you and your fellow pilots lived in? Everybody Why? lived in tents. Mm -hmm. That's the way. And, and the enlisted men, the officers, everybody lived the same. We all lived in tents. And I had two friends, uh, Don, Don Farah and Charlie English and myself, and we decided we didn't want to live in a tent. We built a little hut, and we scrounged around the island. We found all the corrugated strips of metal and wood and tarps and whatever we could find, and we built a little hut. Mm -hmm. And it was fun, it was nice. Yeah. Now, um, 
Was there any, when you weren't flying uh, missions on from Ayashima, I'm sure there were days when you w weren't flying. What did you do to like pass time? Were you like was was there like things that you did or nothing? None of the pilots get got the flying time that we wanted. If we flew five, six, ten hours a month, we were lucky. Mm -hmm. And the rest of the time, we, there was nothing else to do. We listen. We had a little radio. We listened to the ball games. We went down to the water side and then jumped in the water in the ocean and swam around. Some of us had additional duties like mess officer, transportation officer, or entertainment officer. There was always an additional duty that you were assigned, which was not what we wanted. Mm -hmm. It's not what we, not why we were listed. Yeah. So um, how many missions did you fly when you were overseas with, with the 50th? Oh, I don't Air remember. Force? Did you, did you remember any one in particular that you might have flown? And, uh, oh, there was some that I remembered because mm -hmm. on two occasions I lost one engine mm -hmm. and thank goodness I was flying the 38, which has two engines and you can fly on one engine. So I had to come back, fly the rest of the mission on one engine. Was that because of mechanical failure? Or yeah, well, the engine started burning, so you have to shut it down, feather your prop and, mm -hmm. and trim it up and finish your mission. So when you were on Aishima with the eighth, what was the eighth fighter group's job? Was it to strafe? Jack we did. We did a lot of stuff. We did uh, 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 local reconnaissance and what they called sweeps, uh, just flying around looking, making sure there was nothing going on. We did rescue flying cover for rescue missions, where we would fly cover, and there would be a submarine or a navy flying boat rescuing a down air crew member. Uh, we went up to Japan and uh, and did the missions up there, reconnaissance mm -hmm. and uh, whatever we could do. Yeah. Um, do you um, did you ever encounter any Japanese aircraft? When no. You um, by that time, the the Japanese had withdrawn most of their almost all their airplanes mm -hmm. uh, because they were expecting an invasion. Mm -hmm. So they wanted to save their fighter planes to defend the homeland. So they had, uh, they had kind of let everything go on yeah. their homeland. Yeah. And now, um, did you ever like encounter like missions like against the jet against like Japanese? Did you ever encounter like any aircraft fire no. or not, nothing like that? Never. Never. So they really pulled back yeah, by the time were, you got overseas. They were, they were beaten. They they mm -hmm. had, uh, you know, they 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 didn't have any oil. Mm -hmm because all the oil, all the fuel they get, they had to import, and they still do today. They had no fertilizer. I have to tell you, when we got to Japan for occupation duty, and we had to travel from Fukuoka to Washia Airfield, and we went through there, you know, miles and miles, and every piece of their land is cultivated because they have just so much land, they feed so many people. Mm -hmm. So everything is cultivated, and the stench was so overwhelming that we we all in our jeeps we would put handkerchiefs around our nose because we couldn't stand the smell of, of how they were fertilizing their fields. Mm -hmm. They walked around with these bamboo poles across their shoulders. At the end of each pole, there was a pail and a ladle, and they would walk around. They would save all the all the droppings, animal and human, and they would use all this human waste. To fertilize their fields, and the sm that's why we were told when we got up there, don't drink any any Japanese water, don't eat any Jap, don't go and eat any Japanese food, because it was all contaminated. Mm -hmm. So while you were still on Aishima, um, you said you were flying like rescue, like spawning like rescue missions for like downed pot downed airmen or shipwreck survivors, things like that. Yes. How did you flew you flew missions like that yes. yourself, right? Do you remember any one in particular where you were successfully able to? Um, well, we didn't. That? We did cover, to, mm -hmm. and then uh, when our gas, our fuel went low, we would have to be relieved. So I don't remember. I mean, I, we were up at altitude, mm -hmm. you know, and, and you're not looking down; you're looking around. Oh, okay. So I don't remember watching anybody being. Rest pulled out of the water. Actually pulled out of the water. I thought you were like flying like. I remember I right. saw a submarine. I didn't remember I saw the Japanese. I mean the uh, the Navy Dumbo planes, the rescue planes, landing in the water. Yeah, I saw that. Mm -hmm. And on just 
a few days, we were on one of those missions a few days before the war ended, and we were low on fuel, so we were leaving, and we were relieved by another flight of four, P, uh, four P-38s from my group. I forgot which squadron, but it was from my group, and we left, and I found out later that just minutes after we left, the, the group that relieved us, the flight of four, were attacked by Japan, four Japanese fighter planes. And they got into a dog fights and they shot down three of the Japanese planes, but they, sh they lost one, one American. Mm -hmm. That was just days before the, uh, the war ended. Wow. And do you know anything what happened about that one American that was shot no. down? Nothing? Wow. And um, for, the, for the reconnaissance missions that you'd fly, do you like, remember like, what specifically you were like, looking for, or scouting for? Or? We were looking for anything. Actually, I mean, it was more uh, just a, a, an excuse to get some flight time in. We just flew and sometimes you'd go all the way up to Japan and back. Wow. Now, um, and how long were you on Aishima for? Before six months. Went? Six months. And when the atomic bomb was finally dropped twice and the war finally ended, what was, when you found, first heard about Hiroshima and, and Nagasaki and the Japanese finally admitting that they lost, what was your reaction? What were the reactions of We were stunned. Everybody was stunned. Actually, the fighter pilots were kind of, di kind of disappointed. <coughs> We, we, we were looking forward to the invasion. We, we couldn't wait for that. I mean, we knew that they were beaten. We had superior pilots, we had superior planes, and that's why we enlisted. We wanted to see combat. So we were disappointed. I know we were. We used to talk about it. And, uh, 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 but we were all stunned. Nobody expected it. No one. Yeah, because we had firebombed all their other cities and they still didn't give up and finally after these two bombs were dropped they finally just oh yeah gave they, up yeah they they finally yeah. Un, un, unconditionally surrendered so were you you and your your group were you preparing for the invasion of japan oh sure that's you what were, we were waiting for mm -hmm. that's why we were trained that's so, what we were sent over there for yeah. we were waiting wanting it yeah so you were like would there have like briefings of like Supposed targets that you would go after or missions or no, things like we, that? No, nobody knew anything. Nobody we knew were, anything. We were just pilots. What you were we just know? sitting and waiting. We were just waiting, waiting. Yeah. And so after um, the bombs were dropped and Japan finally surrendered in September of 45, and then right after they surrendered, that was when you and your group, you flew to Japan for occupation. Yes, we went up to uh, Kyushu, the southernmost island of Japan. Uh, to a city, Fukuoka, and the airfield that we flew out of was a Shia airfield, which was outside of Fukuoka. And we were there for a few months, and then they moved us from Fukuoka, so we stayed right at the airfield at a Shia. We were bivouac there. Mm -hmm. Now, can you just your time at Fukuoka, I mean, I know you described earlier how they cultivated their land and everything. Could you describe, like, how the Japanese people treated you and reacted when you first arrived, um, how, what, if there was like a, you were interested in like how the way their culture worked as opposed to American culture, were you? Oh, the people, so respectful, so nice. And the young, youngsters, we had a great sense of humor, really nice people, I liked them a lot. The Japanese. Yes. Yeah. And um, while at, at Fukuoka, and you were there for how long, you said? We were there from November until July. And what were your primary duties and responsibilities while on? My the primary picture? duty is mess officer. So, uh, so you were just in charge of... of uh... I knew nothing about mess officer. <laughs> nothing. And it was boring and, I, and that's not why I enlisted. Yeah. And we were, none of us were getting what the flying time that we wanted. We were, we, they strained to get us flying time just to get the flight pay. Mm -hmm. And so after Fukuoka, you moved on to, where was the next place you went to after Fukuoka? That was it. That just Fukuoka? I was repatriated. After six months, I was repatriated. I, after six months at Fukuoka. July 1946, yeah. came back. And um, did you ever go travel outside of Fukuoka, like to Tokyo? Or no, I had no transportation. No transportation? I, no, I was just... Uh, so you were stuck there for, just, for six months. I was months. just a lieutenant. Uh, yeah. What did I know? And... Um, 
While you were in Japan, is that when your group transitioned from P-38s to P-51s? Yes, we got those hot little airplanes. Boy, a lot of fun. Different, so different from the P-38. It was mm -hmm. quicker, it was not faster, but it was quicker. You got there quicker. Whatever you did, you, you know, responded so fast. And uh, uh, it was a lot of fun. The P-38, easy to fly, very, very uh, 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 stable. Um, you can put it into a stall and, and just ease up on the stick and it comes right out of the stall and no counter-rotating props, very stable, gorgeous airplane, especially over water with two engines. Yeah, great plane. But the P-51, that's a hot plane. Yeah. A lot of fun. So, um, do you remember when it was when you were in Japan when you transitioned from the 38s to the 51s? Yeah, it was around April of 1946. So of the three planes that you that you flew, the fighter planes, the P-39, the P-38, and the P-51, of those three, which one was like the one that you preferred or the one that you enjoyed the most? It all depends on what you want to do with it. Mm -hmm. If you're going to go fly over water for a long time, give me the P-38 with two engines. If you want to go and have fun and zip around, or play follow the leader, do aerobatics and whatever, P-51, yeah. Yeah. Was there any like, um, did you guys like with, when you got the P-51s in on occupation when you were flying around, were there like games that you would play with each yeah, other? Yeah, of course. Yeah. It, of course. <laughs> you, you've had mock combat. Mm -hmm. It was, or you do follow the leader aerobatics or formation flying, low level. Hedge hopping. No rules, no rules. Really fun. So you would get down well, on the low deck. on the de hedge on hopping the deck. basically. Wow. That must have been a thrill. <laughs> well, I know when we were training for that at, at uh, Chico, mm -hmm. the instructor would say, all right, well, today we're gonna train for low level flying and we zip along. You know, I'm talking about 15, 20 feet off the ground. And his instructions were, stay above me because if you go below me, you're gonna be in the ground. Wow. And um, so after at Fukuoka, the six months were up in July of 46, when you came July, back? July 46. So and when you came home, did you travel by ship or were you uh, by, by ship? By ship. Sea Star. It took, I don't know, two weeks. Can you just, do you remember like the journey home after, uh, after you oh, were coming this, home? The, the boat was packed with people. We were, uh, I don't know how many, 30, 40, 50 in, in a room and we had quadruple bunks. And when you got up out of bed, you, you had to be careful not to hit the bed above you, the cot of bed above you. And when you got up, you, the bed would just tilt up and snap into place. And, and it was crowded, I, awful. But they had an entertainment unit. They had a USO troupe with girl singers and dancers and the musicians. And they put on shows for all the servicemen on the ship. Yeah, it was, it was nice. Yeah. And so when you finally arrived back home, you docked in California. I assume right when you came back. I got there. We went to Camp Beale for separation. Uh, we went through all the paperwork. We turned in our guns and our our bayonets and knives, combat knives. We turned all that in and collected our back pay. And then they had a um, a facility there where they enabled the pilots if they wanted, they could take the FAA tests. Uh, and get your commercial license. And they waived the requirement for flight testing because they knew we had been flying for years. So they waived that. All we had to do, they had the rule books, and we just had to sit there and learn the rules of flying in the States. And then I took my test. I was 22 years old, and I got my commercial pilot's license, multi-engine, unlimited. Very impressive. I was impressed. <laughs> So when you arrived back home, was there a welcome home ceremony waiting for you for you guys when you docked, or was that all over when you found the war was over? Mm -hmm. The uniforms had no more glamour. Yeah. It was all finished. Mm -hmm. That was it. And so when you when you, after you uh, transitioned out, you made the trip from the West Coast back here to New York to your parents. I stayed on the West Coast for well, I don't know three or four or five days because I had no uniform. My parents had to mail my uniforms out there uh, because all I had was my khakis. When I went overseas, I... I oh, you didn't take your uniform no, when you I, went overseas? No, I just went over. I didn't want to ruin my beautiful uniform. Yeah. Pinks and greens. So my parents mail them out to a, a 
friend of mine who was with me served with me, and he lived out there, so uh, they mailed the uniform. So I, I was out there for about maybe three or four or five days. So you just wore your sun tan khakis? Well, my, my uniform was waiting for me when I got there. Mm -hmm. When I left Camp Beal, like, I came down mm -hmm. L.A. Yeah, but when you were overseas, all you wore was just... Well, the... I wore my flight suit or my khakis. Wow. And so that's actually pretty... I, didn't, I never knew that that's pretty interesting that you had to have your parents mail your uniform to you when you got back. Um, so when you, I assume you, you traveled by rail from the West Coast back to New York. Where did you go first after you? Um, I don't, I think I flew. Yeah, I think I flew. I don't remember. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think I flew back. And uh, when you finally got home, you know, what was the react? What was the feeling or the reaction when you finally saw your parents? Well, my family, of course, they were thrilled to have me back, and they were proud, and so mm -hmm. on. And I went right up to New Haven, went to see the dean, and arranged for my return to school. Mm -hmm. and they gave me. I said, "How much credit do I get?" Because I'd only completed my freshman year, yeah. and they gave me six months credit. And I, I was incredulous. And I argued with him. I said, how, how can you give me only six more half a year credit? About four years in the so Well, yeah, but you didn't study all these courses and stuff. So, so when you uh, got back, one of the first things you did was you went back to back to school. To went back to school. Uh, I wanted to accelerate because I had all that time to make up. I was 22, um, and I, I Yale had a summer session. Uh, that summer, so I attended summer session, and then I did the the rest of the year, September and winter session, and then the next summer I wanted to attend again. But they, by that time, they figured that most of the veterans had come home and they didn't want to do another summer session. So I went to the dean. I said, "Where you know, where can I go that you will give me credit?" And they said, "Well, which ones are you interested in?" And I picked the University of Florida and UCLA. I wanted to be in a playground area, but I was serious about study. And he said, well, he said, Florida, no, we can't, we can't accept Florida. We can't give you any credit for Florida. Sorry, Florida. But they said, yes, UCLA is fine. We'll give you full credit. So I went to UCLA and... What did you study? Studied uh, business law, psychology, because psychology was my major in undergraduate school and some other course, I forgot. And then after you graduated, what, you, what did you go on? And I graduated from Yale in February of 46, seven, eight, February, uh, I think February, I forgot what year. And then I, I was accepted to Harvard Law School, so I went to Harvard Law School. Graduated, I was 27 years old. From when you graduated from Harvard Law? Yes. And then you became a, what kind of lawyer were you? Um, general practice. General practice. Yeah. And how long did you practice law for? For the rest of my life, till I grad, till I retired. And when did you retire? I don't remember. <laughs> when I was 60 something. Yeah. Wow. And, um, well, Dino, this has been great talking to you and listening uh, to your story, to listening to your story. Um, again, I want to say thank you. Uh, for agreeing to do this today, and I guarantee you, when I uh, share this on on the internet, I guarantee you, there's going to be a lot of yeah. uh, interest and a lot of people. What a, it was such a thrill to serve this country and do what I did, and have them teach. And they paid me. I would have, I would have done it really seriously. I would have done it for nothing. That they would have trained me for nothing. What a great opportunity! Unbelievable. Yeah. And uh, do you have anything uh, that you wish to say? Um, Finally, um, or is we live in a great country? Yes, we do. Yes, we do. Um, Dino, thank you so much You're for this. Welcome, thank Andy. you. You're welcome.